Hey everyone, uh, thank you all for coming to Game Plan. If you are new, thank you for coming to our session. If you are a returning guest, you know what we do here. We have great discussions about sports and professional healthcare careers. So we have a great guest today. We have Dr. Uh, Shannon Clemens Good. Do, do you say everything together or just Dr. Good? <laughs> it's just Dr. Good now. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so we have Dr. Good here. And she is a former swimmer and currently a sports medicine physician. So Dr. Good is a primary care sports medicine physician who joined Oxner Sports Medicine Institution in 2020 after finishing her fellowship at UHS Wilson Memorial Hospital in Bingham, New York. She graduated cum, um, magna cum laude from Howard University. H-U-U. You know. You know. <laughs> Sports medicine. She later attended Meharry College and served as Student National Medical Association president. She's completed her residency at the University of Miami, uh, uh, the University of Miami at Holy Cross Hospital, and she's here to give us some great, great, great information. So, Doctor Good, it's on you. Take it away, and thank you for joining us. Hello, everyone. So we had a, that was a nice introduction. Thank you so much. It definitely highlighted my educational career, but I'm going to take it back just a little bit. I was born and raised on the south side of Chicago, in Chicago, Illinois, in the Midwest. Um, both of my parents, well, my father's from Chicago. My mother is from uh, Louisville, Kentucky. They met in Chicago, stayed in Chicago. That's where I was from. Um, Sports were always in my family. My father actually used to referee Big Ten college football. My godfather played for the Bulls in the 60s. Uh, I have another godfather who I call, we're going to name them uncles because I call them all uncles that have refereed for the NFL and the NBA. Um, I was always involved in sports, but the kickoff for it was when I was younger, around three or four years old, was at a barbecue for a coworker of my dad. And I fell in a pool in an inner tube upside down and did not know how to swim. And someone had to pull me out the water. And my mother basically put me in swim lessons that week. Um, I took swim lessons at Chicago State University, which is a school on the south side of Chicago off the of 95th and MLK. Um, a lot of prominent uh, people, especially African-Americans that learned how to swim in Chicago came through the Chicago State program actually um shortly before the pandemic my mother went there and she learned how to swim um in her fifth decade of life um and she is still an active swimmer so they have a really good program caught the the swim bug um, decided to go out for the swim team and at this time i probably was like six or seven years old there were a couple other activities i was involved in i was involved in the chicago children's choir which was a, um, a citywide choir in Chicago that you had to audition for and that would travel around the United States and the world and do concerts. And I did a couple other activities, but I took it upon myself to join the swim team. Um, so I joined the Ridge Park Water Rats, which is on 95th and Longwood on, in the neighborhood of Beverly in Chicago um, and joined the swim team. And that's where things really started to take off. I was a very serious swimmer. Um, this was a club sport. We swam year round. We competed in uh, city and statewide events. In addition to being on the swim team, I participated in lifeguarding events on a national level um, while in middle school. I continued to swim on through high school um, at Morgan Park High School, home of the Mustangs. <laughs> Um, I was a swimmer there in the off season. I ran track. I was never, I never ran track prior to then, um, but I had a couple of girlfriends that were on the track team and swim season is in the fall. And of course, when swim season was over, I wanted to participate in activities to keep me um, active in the off season and wanted to venture out from swim because I've always been fascinated by other sports. Took a very early interest in gymnastics. I remember in the 90s, 1996 Olympics in Atlanta, um, I, I had the Wheaties box. It might still be in my house somewhere in Chicago, but the Wheaties box with the Magnificent Seven, Shannon Miller, Dominic Dawes, Dominique Muciano, Carrie Strug, and a couple more people um, from the women's U.S. Women's National Team won gold at the Olympics. And I was very involved in um, gymnastics, never fully took on gymnastics, but took on tumbling in my spare time. 
Um, but I had a couple of girlfriends that were on the track team and one of them was really good. She actually went on to run at the University of Texas and she invited me to try out for the track team to do track in the off season. Um, I've always been a short sprinter. Uh, for those of you that do sports that have, are broken down into short, middle and long distance, I am the epitome of a sprinter. When I did participate in local and statewide meets for swimming, we would have to swim every event, which included the 500 freestyle, which I dreaded. <laughs> uh, so joining the track team, I was a short sprinter. Um, and I, that was, I had a lot of anxiety, a lot of performance anxiety doing distance swimming when I was growing up. Um, but I feel like one of my ultimate athlete moments was my freshman year of high school my coach put me in the 400 yard uh, dash at an indoor meet. And um, I was nervous because the only time I had really ever run 400 yards was in practice for a warm up. I was 100, 200, 50 yard dash. And we were, uh, it was at a, 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 a high school meet and they called our name, they called our heat in our lane. And I said I was present. And um, as soon as they marked me present, I projectile vomited into a garbage can. Um, my father remembers that moment well. He said he and my mom were in the stands looking for us and he couldn't find me. And then when he did find me, I had my head in a garbage can. And my coach, Coach Calhoun, who is notoriously known in Chicago, the Morning Park High School women's track team, would win city and state back to back years all the time. It was a very rigorous program. Um, was probably the epitome of one of the best coaches I've ever had. Pat me on the shoulder and politely told me to go sit down. <laughs> um, so I've had my fair share of moments um, in sports uh, where you have that performance anxiety, you wanna do well, things get the best of you. Uh, we got a 400 meter runner here more power to you. There was no way I was going <laughs> to make that race. Um, but very early on in sports is where I learned determination, consistency, and perseverance. Um, when I was, like I said, I'm not a distance person. I'm a sprinter when it comes to uh, meets and performance. But you know, when you practice, especially if anybody's ever been a swimmer, we're swimming thousands of yards a day and we're doing drills for every single event. And more times than not, when we were doing a drill that was longer than 150, 200 yards, I was the last person coming in. Um, but one of my other coaches, uh, Terry McShane for the Chicago Water Rats, was consistently, um, he was a, another really good coach that kept me motivated. We would have lane assignments from four, three, two, one, it was four lane pool, with one and two being the top swimmers in the group. And while I would consistently come in last, um, he would keep me in lane two for a long time and even tried to push me up to lane one. And I, I was too intimidated, too afraid, didn't want to go. But I put in that hard work. I would consistently go to more than one practice. Our practices were broken up into beginner, intermediate, and advanced practices. I would consistently go to intermediate and advanced practices multiple days a week when I could see fit. Practice was five days a week. I practice six to seven days a week, um, put in a lot of hard work and determination um, and hard work and determination really pays off. Um, the football coach, Lexi Spurlock, rest in peace, who just passed away. He was a football coach at uh, Chicago's Morgan Park High School, had a poster on his wall in his office that said hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. I stand by that because I do not feel that I was a natural swimmer per se but I put in the hard work and it definitely showed. And I was very successful on my younger days in swimming. So swam all the way through um, high school, my sophomore year of high school. Um, well, back up a little bit, big football fan, had always been a Miami Hurricane fan, go Kings. I don't know what it was. I think in part, it was in Florida. I was in Chicago in the cold. I wanted to go somewhere warm. Um, had been a huge Hurricane fan. They had the same colors as my high school. So I and if I go there for college, I don't have to change any of my school spirit things. I was awarded most school spirit my senior year of high school. You know, I've always been big into sports and supporting my school. Um, but in the 2003 Fiesta Bowl, Ohio State versus University of Miami, 
which is a game that my father and I often debate about because he is a Big Ten fan, but he's not an Ohio State fan, but he was pulling for Ohio State that day to beat Miami, and I was rooting for Miami. Um, Willis McGahee had a terrible injury on the field, a multi-ligamous injury on the field, and there was a lot of hoopla around it. I saw a lot of people run out onto the field and help him and um, followed his progress closely. And it was in that moment that I said, I think I want to go into sports. I want to run out on the field when something happens. And I was very interested in that, but just didn't know how to go about doing that. Within a month, I tore the meniscus in my left knee and had to have knee surgery. And that was my first introduction to orthopedic surgery. So in that moment, I knew I wanted to go into some type of sports medicine. Initially, that path was for me to do athletic training, go to University of Miami. They had an athletic training program. My personal statement for college was about that event with Willis McGahee and how that had me interested in athletic training. And I wanted to go to University of Miami. Now being from Chicago and being an only child, my father saw Miami being a 21 hour drive away as a no go. <laughs> and he in the nicest way possible told me, you're not going to Florida. And um, the ultimate decision was not mine, it was my father's, but I often say that is the best decision my father ever made for me. He sent me to Howard University in Washington, DC. And I get to Howard University and I meet with a guidance counselor. And at that time, I hadn't really picked a major um, because I hadn't researched majors at Howard University. I was going to Miami. I knew who my roommate was gonna be at Miami. It was all Miami. So I told her I was interested in sports medicine and she said, we have a sports medicine major. Um, it's pre-med, but it is a sports medicine major, basically an exercise physiology major with a minor in chemistry. Are you interested? And I said, yes. Um, and I remember going to my first biology class and being in a room of people that were all, I'm going to be a doctor. I'm going to be a dentist. I'm going to be a pharmacist. I caught the doctor bug and decided to pursue um, my pre-medical studies with the goal of going on to medical school. While at Howard, just like when I was in high school, attended every football game, was very active with supporting sports on campus. Um, took an athletic training course at Howard that allowed me to be a student athletic trainer for a couple of semesters while I was at Howard University. Um, but this is where that pivot, which was big for me to go from just student athlete to student took place, which was an adjustment because I was very used to being an athlete. Um, but stayed at Howard, majored in sports medicine, minor in chemistry. Initially applying to medical school, did not get in right away. I was waitlisted at most of the institutions I applied to. Meharry Medical College, which is a historically black medical school in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, offered me a position into their post-baccalaureate program. And at the time, their post-baccalaureate program, if you had a certain GPA and MCAT after the year of the program, you were kind of conditional acceptance into medical school. So I went to Meharry um, with the intentions of being an orthopedic surgeon. Still, it was surgery. And ironically, I was just talking about this with some medical students earlier today doing a simulation lab with the medical students from the University of Queensland at Oshner. And they were asking me how I got into my field. So I wanted to do orthopedic surgery. Um, and that was where I, I thought I wanted to go. There was at one point where I thought I might want to go into a different direction, but orthopedic surgery onto sports medicine was going to be my career. Um, I did a summer internship program with the Inth Dimensions program with an introduction into orthopedics an eight week program. I was you know, hands on, it was great. Got to my third year medical school rotations and I was on my surgery rotation. Um, Harry Medical College is partnered with Metro, was partnered with Metro General Hospital in Nashville. And at the time there was no residency program associated with the surgical department at our institution. Also at this time, there were no nurse practitioners or physician assistants that worked in the surgery department. So as a third year medical student, we were pretty much treated like residency interns. Um, and so we were first assist on everything. I carried a pager. I got to the hospital at 3.30 in the morning to pre-round and put in orders on my patients. Um, and the experience was, I'm forever grateful for because in my third year surgery rotation, I was doing the work of a surgical intern. But 
it was in that rotation that I realized I don't think surgery is cut out for me. Um, I didn't like being on call. I didn't like carrying the pager, things like that. Um, and so I had to make a pivot and actually pivoted into um, primary care and then on into primary care sports medicine. Um, went on to do my primary care uh, residency at the University of Miami Holy Cross in Fort Lauderdale, which wasn't easy. I actually didn't match into residency um, my first year. I failed my first board exam, uh, which was a very discouraging moment. And for me, I think made me less um, desirable as a candidate for residency. I also feel that in that moment, I kind of gave up. I really never failed at anything. And failing my first board exam didn't put in as much pressure or enthusiasm to matching into residency. And I didn't match my first year out of medical school. So I moved back to Chicago, tried very hard to get a job in research or something like that and couldn't. So I took a job at Bloomingdale's at 900 North Michigan. I worked in the fine jewelry department. I remember going on my interview and my manager said, I can't hire you. You have a medical degree, you're a whole doctor. And I told her, I need a job. This is where that persistence comes in on to stay busy and to stay moving forward. And uh, she gave me a job in the fine jewelry department. Um, I went on to reapply for residency and match at the University of Miami. I did my residency in internal medicine. Um, came around after residency, actually did not even match into fellowship for primary care sports medicine. I had four resident four fellowship interviews. Um, and each time I was told, you know, your application is not that strong. I had an interview at Rush University in Chicago. I had done an away rotation there for about four weeks prior to over the summer. Interviews were in the fall. And uh, the program director actually told me, she said, you know, if I were to just look at your resume or your curriculum vitae, I might not interview you because your application, is, your resume is not that strong. Um, but you really showed out during your rotation. Um, I put in the work, that hard work needs talent when talent doesn't work hard. I put in the work and she saw that and she interviewed me. Um, and so interviewed, did those four interviews, match day came around and for the second time, no interview. Um, but this is something I like to preach to people about no matter what you do, always do the right thing and always work your hardest um, and put your best foot forward because you never know when an opportunity will, will come around. A lot of people say um, luck is when opportunity meets preparedness and that's, that's really true. One of the places I interviewed for fellowship was Drexel University in Philadelphia, and their program director told me the same thing every other program director told me about not having a strong application, but that they saw something in me. And he told me, if you don't match, it's fellowship, you let me know. Um, so when I didn't match, uh, I emailed every program that had a vacant position and sent them my CV and my personal statement. And I, I remembered and I let this program director know. And he told me, he said, okay, hang tight. You know, I'm gonna, you know, reach out to some people. And before I went to shut my computer down, I had an email from him that I was CC'd on that said, um, hey, Jill, know this applicant, she's great. And you get a chance to check her out. I don't know who Jill was. <laughs> I just saw that and it didn't say at a university email. I didn't know where this was, but within a couple hours, um, Dr. Jill Sadowski of UHS Wilson Memorial Hospital called me um, to interview me over the phone. Um, and long story short, I was offered a position into fellowship. Um, again, a lot of that came from just putting my best foot forward at all times because I had not applied to that program for fellowship. Um, she didn't have my contacts for references and I have to give her three references. One of those references being my program director from residency. So after I gave her those references, I text all those people and told them that there was a program director that was gonna be reaching out. I knew the first person she was gonna call was my program director from residency. I text my program director and he told me, um, I'm out of the country, won't be back for a week. You know, I don't know what I can do. And I, I was a little sad, but I said, you know, okay. She called me back a couple hours later and told me what I knew. She said, I called your program director. He didn't pick up, but I talked to your associate program director. 
And I held my breath for a little bit because this was a program director that I had worked with a lot and had um, that she had seen me grow and really work well and had given me accolades while I was in residency, but she still had that fear. And she said, she sang your praises. We want to offer you a position. And I said, yes. Um, I remember running into the room to tell my parents I had a fellowship position and they asked me, well, where is it? And I said, that's a good question because I don't know, because at that time I was willing to go wherever I needed to go to get the training, to get to the next step. Um, a lot of times we get caught up in location, 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 location. And um, sometimes that's not where we need to be. And sometimes we need to go to what's available for us or what's the best fit for us. So I did my residence, my fellowship in Binghamton, New York, which is about an hour south of Syracuse. Um, wonderful opportunity. I was an associate team physician for Binghamton University Athletics, as well as Broome County Community College. Um, and I did my fellowship there, uh, interviewed for um, my position down here at Oshner. Uh, one story I like to tell about me interviewing for Oshner was I saw the position available on LinkedIn and I applied and it was around things. It was like the week before Thanksgiving and um, I went home for Thanksgiving. And when I was at home, I, as I always do, my mother has a lot of books on her shelf and I go through the bookshelf and I pick a book. And this time, the book that I picked was the book by Tony Dungy, Quiet Strength. And I remember reading that book and being in the middle of that book when I got the call that I was to interview at Ashner. The most beautiful thing about that book, and if you don't know who Tony Dungy is, you are missing out. You have, he is the first African-American football coach to win a Super Bowl. Tony Dungy is a legend. He is a Hall of Famer. This man is one of the, the most composed um, and Im impressive people out there, not just coaches, not just in NFL, but in sports altogether. But an interesting story he talks about in his book is um, how he stays true to himself. He is a Christian man. He believes in doing right by people. He doesn't believe in raising his voice and cursing. And for a long time, he got a lot of slack for that, for not being that aggressive in your face type coach. Um, but he stayed true to himself. And when he was released from the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, who actually went on to win a Super Bowl shortly after, um, he thought that he would never coach again. Um, and one day, and this is back in the day, depending on your age, you might not be familiar with a voicemail box that people keep at their houses. But before there was voicemail on cell phones, we had little recorder boxes in our houses that people would call and leave messages on. And he said he came home one day and his wife said, um, someone called you and you need to call them back. He said, oh, no, no, no. You know, I'm not coach. He said, no, you need to call him back. And it was the owner of the Indianapolis Colts. And what the owner of the Indianapolis Colts told Tony was, you are a man of your word. Um, you stay true to yourself. You always do what's right. And um, that's what I need to lead my football team. There are, it's those characteristics that I need to lead my football team. Mind you, these are the same characteristics that people would say were negative about Tony Dungy. And these are the reasons that got him hired to go on to coach a Super Bowl winning team. Um, and so if you've never read that book, that's one of those books that I like to go back to often to read uh, Tony Dungy, Quiet Strength. Um, but I went on, interviewed at Oshner. And one of the things that clinched the job for me was they said, we need a team doc over at Xavier University and at the time Dillard University until my colleague came on and now he's full-time at Dillard and I said sign me up you know as a two-time HBCU grad um, I've always loved collegiate atmospheres first but always our HBCU atmospheres um, and given this opportunity to be assigned at an HBCU on a collegiate on um, these collegiate sports levels was like a dream come true um, and so I took the position and I've been down here since September, 2020 doing uh, 
doing my work with Xavier University, with a lot of the local high schools in the area. I cover our um, high school football games in the fall. I cover the home basketball games for men and women's basketball for Xavier University. I cover the Xavier University volleyball uh, team home games. I see athletes of track and field, softball, tennis, uh, baseball, cheer, um, and soon to be soccer um, at Xavier University, as well as other sports in the area. Um, and I'm still very much so immersed in the sports um, arena. You know, I sit on the sidelines <laughs> at the basketball game or I'm sitting right behind the sideline at the basketball game. I've had opportunities to participate in other sporting events. Um, there was the HBCU Legacy Bowl last year, which was an NFL combine for HBCU athletes, football athletes that I was able to work the sideline on. Um, there was an HBCU basketball game last um, year that showcases, showcased basketball talent from the different HBCUs. I got to work that game. Very much so still immersed in the sports arena, um, but from a different angle. Um, I get to help people get back to their game. I think that's what I love most about my profession is that most patients come to me because they are limited in doing something, usually something active related, not necessarily athletically related, but my patients range from high school, middle school soccer players to weekend warriors to, you know, women in their 80s who just want to be able to walk around the grocery store. They're usually trying to get back active. And I do a lot of procedures um, and exercise programs in my clinic to get these people back to being active, um, which I can empathize with wholeheartedly because when I tore my meniscus, I had to go through, I was out, I had to go through rehab and I had to build my way back up to get back on that track and in the pool, which I eventually did, but it was a struggle and it was a hard struggle. I don't know if there's anybody on here that's ever had a significant injury that took them um, off the court and put them on the bench, but it's hard to support your team um, and to be enthusiastic when you're sitting on the bench, but it happens and it happens more times than not. I mean, I think now in the digital age that we live in, we're able to have access to the lives of these athletes on a different level to see that there are things that require extra attention outside of a coach um, to get them and keep them to do well in their sports. Um, a piece of advice I would give people is um, remaining persistent and resilient in what it is that you want to move forward in doing and not give up. Uh, I think the biggest piece of that puzzle of remaining resilient and pushing and moving forward has to do with a support system. Um, I always like to credit my support system for believing in me when I did not believe in myself, because there are moments where I did not believe in myself and I did not think I could move forward. And it was the support and the belief and prayers of others who could. One of those moments being when I was in college, I decided I didn't want to be pre-med anymore. Um, I was going through a phase, decided I, I didn't want to do pre-med anymore. And I went, studied abroad at the University of New South Wales, Sydney, Australia. I went as far away as I could. Um, and when I got back, one of my good girlfriends pulled me to the side that, that spring semester. She said, did you get it out your system? I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, you said you were going to be a doctor. Um, and I figured you were going through a phase. And I'm here to remind you that you set out on this journey that you are more than capable of doing. And we need to get you back on track. She wasn't even a science major. She was just a friend of mine, a good support system um, that helped me get through that time. Um, a lot of my closest friends are friends that I made in college and in med school. Um, my roommate from my freshman year of college lives here in New Orleans, and I talk to her weekly. We see each other. We're still best friends to this day, you know, and I'm thankful for that friendship. Um, two of my best girlfriends from medical school, I talk to via a group chat every day. We're still supporting each other and being there for each other. You know, there have been people that say you are the sum of the five people you are around and you are the closest with, and I think that that very important um, 
to know the quality of the character of those that you keep around you because they do rub off on you just how you feel like you might influence someone else you are influenced whether or not you are um, conscious about it by those around you and it's very important to keep your circle of people supporting you and moving forward um, but know that you know you can do whatever you want to put your mind to whether you feel that you are naturally gifted in it or not back to coach Spurlock and that poster on his lot on his office hard work beats talent and talent doesn't work hard um, and it just takes that push from within yourself and that support from those around you to be able for you to accomplish your dreams and it can happen and it's not just you know there's there's so many avenues in sports now i have a lot of athletes at xavier that say okay i'm not going to be playing professionally but i still want to be in sports and i have a baseball player that expressed that to me and said he doesn't want to go the medical route but he's still interested in sports um and that he really liked baseball and i told him i said we have um an athletic trainer who went on to get a PhD, she used to work for Austin, she's in Texas now, that her PhD is basically in baseball pitching mechanics. Um, she was a softball player growing up, um, you know, was an athletic trainer in baseball uh, on a collegiate level and was so drawn to it that she decided to make that her pursuit or her passion. And once a year when we do our grand lectures, she comes and she lectures to us on that and if you have never been told about the pitching mechanics of baseball i would highly suggest you go to youtube and type it in that two to three second pitch can be broken down into about four to five different segments on a very minuscule level on just how intricate each movement is to making a successful baseball pitch. There is a lot of science and kinesiology between that. Actually, they say that pitchers, when they pitch, that's the fastest human motion that one makes, faster than when someone runs and their legs are moving. That arm, when you go to accelerate and then decelerate on a, a pitch, is the fastest movement that the human body can make. Um, and there's a science to it. Now, here we have a former athlete that did not go pro, yet she is like the country's expert on pitching mechanics. Um, and I told this to the athlete, and he looked at me like, what? Like, that's her career? I said, yes, and she's successful. You know, luckily, we live in a day and age where, you know, it used to just be trained for this, find the position you want to do, apply to it, and go from there. Um, nowadays it's more so like you can create the space of what it is that you want to do and pitch it to someone to show your expertise and what you can bring to the table and explain to them why they may need you um and granted i i there's you probably can't go on linkedin and you know we're looking for a pitching mechanic expert you know but this is a career that this is a passion that she chose to pursue and she has work and she is successful in her work. Um, so when it comes to sports, you don't have to just go pro. You know, I think one of my favorite commercials last year, I think it came out at the Super Bowl, or no, it wasn't the Super Bowl, I think it was during the NCAA finals, where they highlighted all these NCAA athletes and how they went on professionally after sport that didn't go pro. And you had all different types of careers that were either in sports or weren't in sports. Um, and so you kind of got to find your niche of what it is you want to do. But I think for me, it was that very early on being really passionate about my sport of swimming and then having that injury and having to sit out and having to rehab and come back um, that really put the bug in my mind was saying like, this is where I want to work in rehabbing these athletes and getting them back to um, back to sport, which I get to do on a daily basis. Um, and it's just like, it's one of the most rewarding things I can do. I think it's kind of selfish of me because um, I get a lot of gratitude and excitement out of helping people. For instance, I had a, 
little 80 year old lady who had a huge knee effusion um, that wasn't infectious. They think she had a reaction to a different type of injection and she came to see me. And when she came in, she had a cane and she was pretty much crying walking down the aisle to the clinic uh, exam room. And I was able to use my ultrasound machine to see that she had a large effusion on her knee. And I drained that fluid off her knee uh, and we injected a little medicine um, and she left. And my assistant had to chase her down the hallway to tell her she forgot her cane because she was feeling so good. She just up and walked out. And I, I get to have those moments often in clinic and it's so rewarding. It's so rewarding um, to be able to have those moments to help people get back to being active. Um, and I, and I, I really love what I do. I love working at the university. I'm probably one of the most excited people in the stands and on the sidelines when I'm at the game. You would think I attended Xavier University as excited as I am. I do wear a Howard University lanyard uh, for my ID chain because that is my alma mater and that is who I represent first and foremost. Um, but I love being at Xavier University and being able to um, work with the athletes there. And then Xavier University sends a lot of minority students to medical school and beyond. And I get to mentor a lot of these pre-med students, which is like a full circle for me because I once was a pre-med student needing guidance to fulfill and further my career. Um, and I get to offer that to those that I, I see at the university. So yeah, it's very rewarding. Uh, love my sports. Um, Olympic come around, glued to the TV. I still get very anxious though when I watch sports and it's close. I'm, I've never been able to shake that. It's literally the same butterfly I got when coach said, you're running the 400, like, let me, you know? But I think that's part of the excitement and the adrenaline we as athletes like, and that helps to fuel us to keep us moving forward. Um, so I still get those moments, whether it's TV or live action when I'm at a Xavier game or a high school football game. Um, and so it's, it's, it's been great. I'm happy to be here and to speak with you all. And um, if there are any questions, feel free. I'm open to answering any questions. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. That was a great, 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 great effect that we have right here. You have a lot of information, a lot of jewels. So at this point, I will ask anybody that is listening, please feel free to come off mute and ask your question directly, or you can use the uh, raise your hand feature and I will call on you. So I'll give you a second to, to strum up a, a question. Anybody, anybody, anybody? I see Miles thinking, there you go, Miles. <laughs> yeah. um, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, sorry, I'm, uh... All right. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, everything you, you said was so relevant to me because I had also come from um, being in track and I would really love to go into sports medicine. Currently, I'm a second year medical student at uh, Icon School of Medicine, Mount Sinai in New York. So right now I'm at that stage where, like you mentioned, with board exams and I'm taking step one at the end of the year. Um, so it's definitely been a bit nerve wracking, but I'm excited and I think like it's a great challenge for me to just apply myself. Um, and so I'm just really inspired by the path that you had and, and the resilience that you mentioned and being able to fail and, and stay at it. And I think I'm at a very hard place in my career, but I definitely could use all those sources of passion um, and inspiration. So I really appreciate that. Um, and I just, a question for you, I'd, I would ask like, what is the most fulfilling part for you, you mentioned getting patients back to where they want to be. I think that's what draws me towards sports medicine and physical medicine. So if you could speak a little bit about, you know, what, what really is that, bring that fulfillment to you. I'd love to hear that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, like I was saying, the cool thing about sports medicine is 90% of the patients that come to me are motivated, which is hard in a lot of other specialties when you're trying to help people. But in the, the path of sports medicine, majority of the people that seek me out are seeking me out because they want to get better. Um, and I would say 80% of the time, 80 to 90% of the time, there's something that I could do to get them better between zero days and six weeks. 
And a lot of those things consist of either a home exercise program, physical therapy, or I do a lot of ultrasound guided injections in the clinic. Um, I think the most fulfilling part about what I do, as much as I love working with athletes, which is where this all started out, is that I have a lot of patients that are octogenarians. If you don't know what an octogenarian is, that's somebody that's in their 80s. And that 80 and up is a special group of people. If you know anybody over the age of 80, I recommend you just go talk to them and ask them questions about life and things like that. Um, but a lot of, I have a lot of those patients that are either trying to put off knee replacement or might need knee or hip replacement and I come back and see. Um, but being a physician and being it and having this time, you know, gives you the opportunity to interview people. Um, and not just on medical matters, okay? And so I fully take advantage of these interactions with people as opportunities to learn life lessons. Um, somebody asked me a couple months ago because they, I did this special for Oshner on home exam program, uh, home exercise programs, like what's your stereotypical patient? And while I see a lot of ap athletes, my stereotypical patient is a little black church lady. She goes to church every Sunday. She probably has about five kids, probably about 30 grandkids. These are my people, <laughs> okay? Um, and they find me. Um, and what I do is for, it's usually 75 of my cutoff as I ask these people, I say, how, how do I make it to 80? Because the average age is not 80. The average age is like, what now, like 76 or something like that for Americans. People aren't living to be 80 years old. Um, and so being their doctor and seeing them, and once we get all the nitty gritty out about their knee pain or their shoulder pain, you know, I take that as an opportunity to ask, like, what do I need to do to make it to 80? I want to make sure I'm putting that on my vision board. I'm going to be an octogenarian. How do I get there? And, um, being able to sit with these people and get these words of advice and these life lessons, you know what I mean? From people with such wisdom, people always say stuff like, um, you only hear this in the middle age to younger people, oh, I'm getting old, I don't wanna get old. And I remember I had this patient when I was in residency that was 105 and she was real jazzy. She had a, a walker and she had a little Florida license plate on it with her name. And she heard somebody say that, she was like, well, I mean, what's the alternative though, right? And you're like, wow, you know? So people in this age group really appreciate life and I love, hearing from them and hearing their words of advice. I recently got married in 2021 and these people have been married for 50 years. I'm like, whoo, I'm, I'm trying to make it to year two. How do I make it to year 50? You know, and it's like the average person doesn't have the opportunity to, to interview somebody at, with that much wisdom. And I get to do it on a daily basis. And I write these things down. And I, and I practice them in everything that I do. So outside of the, you know, people coming back to me and being like, doc, I finally ran another marathon. Like, thanks to you. I got back better. I'm back running. I did that. I did the Boston, right? Those things are fulfilling too. But just as much as having relationship with people and interviewing these interesting people that have the five odds, um, it's so fulfilling and it's so rewarding. And I, I take the time to sit there and talk to them. My assistant will tell me like, okay, you know, time we got, you know, but I've been blessed in that most of the time when I meet someone where I want to ask something, I have time permits for me to do that. And I do that. And I've learned some great life lessons. Thank you so, so much. Dr. Dr. Goods, your enthusiasm comes across, your enthusiasm for life and your enthusiasm for your profession comes across. And so we appreciate that. But you know, part of this initiative is reaching out to student athletes with the message that by virtue of being involved in athletics, it really prepares you for other things in life. We also have to acknowledge that there's a bias against athletes. Can you talk about any experience you've had with people who have been biased against you as an athlete and how you dealt with that? Oh, for sure. The first, the first time I had an issue, I feel like the first time I had an issue with being someone being biased to me for being an athlete was my freshman year of high school. When I was in high school, um, 
there was a chemistry teacher, which I wish I could find him. His name was Mr. Slick and he was this old man and he was just really mean. Um, and he was known for failing students. And uh, Morgan Park was a big athletic powerhouse. And um, naturally, if you're the person making your schedule knew you were an athlete, they would not put you in his class. It was just an automatic, just nope, you're not taking Mr. Slick's class because he's gonna fail you, you're gonna fail that class and um, you're not gonna be able to play or it's gonna look bad on your transcript just instinctively. And for whatever reason, um, there was a mistake made on mine and I got put in his chemistry class. Um, and I remember going to uh, swim practice and my coach, you know, me talking about it, she said, oh, I'm gonna get that change, I'm gonna get that change, like, no. And I was just like, I was a little offended because I said, you know, people don't just fail students. I mean, there are, but people, other people are passing his class and for you to automatically push off on me that I can't be successful in his class is that's I don't like that right I said I'm gonna keep it and I stayed in that class um I actually took chemistry with Dr. Mr. Slick I took AP chemistry with Mr. Slick I took physics with Mr. Slick and I ended up taking AP physics with Mr. Slick because I went in that class and he and he kind of did have an edge on him on here goes up here goes an athlete and he kind of gave it to me pretty hard as far as tough love in the classroom. Um, but kind of like what my dad used to tell me like if you're going to do something you you got to do it and you got to put your best foot forward. he would say that to me when I would swim and do other sports I remember trying out for the choir he was like if you're going to try out now you got to take your A game and I took my A game. Um, to Mr. Slick in that chemistry class. Now I didn't get an A, but I also didn't fail. Um, but that was the first time I felt like I was looked at differently because I was an athlete. And it was strange because I, I was doing fairly decent in school and it was just automatically written off like you're an athlete, you're not going to pass that class, you need to go on to the next. Um, trying to find out Mr. Slick was a track and field official for high school. He, we would go to state meets and he would work the shop pit uh, yard and doing that. And he would still be mean to me. He never warmed up to me until my senior year of high school. He said, you know, there was this scholarship called the Posse Scholarship in Chicago where they would award, they had a couple of different schools and they would award you a full scholarship, but you had to, it was like invitation only. You couldn't just apply. Somebody had to nominate you. And it was to the point that people were nominating, people were paying people to nominate their child. And Mr. Slick pulled me to the side the, the first day of AP Physics, my senior year, my fourth year with him. And he said, I nominated you for the Posse Scholarship. And I was, just, I remember hugging him and him looking at me like, what? You know, cause we had, he had always been so mean and cold. And I was just like, what? Um, and he was like, you know, you're the first athlete I've had that one stayed, took me again, if they even had me in their class, you all would run from me like I was the plague. You know what I mean? And you persistently showed up and did your work. And I almost got that scholarship. I made it to the finals. My, my, one of my classmates made it, but you know, it, it ended up working out really well. But um, that, 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 that was my first challenge of somebody that kind of telling me that I couldn't do something um, because I solely because I was an athlete. Uh, and I took that as a challenge. I'm one of those people, if you tell me, you know, I can't do something that drive kicks in, you know, to, to, to do it if I can and at least work hard trying to do it. We have a hand raised from um, iPhone. Uh, you could come off mute and ask your question. Chuck, um, is that me? Yes, go ahead. Yes. Hey, what's up? Okay. Um, hey, Dr. Good, that was a great talk. Thank you so much. Um, Aaron Steiner, nice to meet you. Um, I was wondering, um, what support do you wish you had had as an undergrad that you didn't get that you think would have helped? Shh, Charlotte, sorry, my daughter is talking in the background. <laughs> um, uh, what support do you wish you had had that, that you didn't get? Um, because, you know, we're, we're working on programs to, to help students with these things. So um, any advice would be much appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Um, first thing would be MCAT prep. Uh, Howard has a really good program for like MCAT prep for those that are biology pre-med majors. But when you're an exercise physiology major in a different department, we're kind of not looked after as great. 
And so um, I definitely wish if you're an undergrad major going into medical school that there are resources for MCAT prep because a lot rides on that MCAT. Um, the other thing I wish, I wish um, I knew about these conferences where I could go and network with people and get out and find out what's out there. There's so many post-bac programs. There's so many other programs that can help you get into medical school or higher education. And a lot of these people that run these programs are at these national and regional conferences. So I would definitely support, I tell my undergrad um, uh, students now to go to the SNMA and other student uh, medical association conf national conferences now to just get that exposure to meet program directors and deans of medical schools out there. Um, the other thing I wish I had was um, actual someone in the field that I could talk to or ask questions to um, out when, when I'm ready to discuss things. I wish I had more mentorship, so more mentorship for sure, because a lot of the mentors know where to go to get these resources, who to talk to, where people will be, um, what programs are friendlier than others and things like that. Um, so as far as undergrad going into med school, definitely more in, definitely focusing on MCAT prep and interview skills and letter uh, personal statement writing. Um, because a lot of us are drawn to writing the generic personal statement, which I kind of was guilty of. And over time, I've realized after reading a lot of different personal statements, being on boards to interview people, just how people stand out through a personal statement. Um, so I would say MCAT prep, um, personal statement writing, um, access to resources to meet other people and individuals um, at the different schools and programs. Um, th that probably would be the biggest uh, resource. But um, and then what another thing that's new now that wasn't as big when I was applying to medical school is getting clinical experience. Um, and that can come from, that could be as much as just shadowing someone uh, in the clinic, having opportunities. I had shadowed an emergency medicine physician maybe once or twice when I was an undergrad, and I really wish I would have had more experience doing that. Or a lot now because of technology, um, a lot of hospitals offer medical scribe uh, opp job opportunities, which are looked well upon on a lot of these institutions. But Support in undergrad, I, I really wish I had more support on uh, studying for the MCAT and preparing for the MCAT and writing my personal statement. Okay, I had a question. You um, you kind of always challenged everything that you that came at you. You talked about uh, everybody running from Mr. Slick. You talked about almost drowning in a pool and then becoming a swimmer. So how important is it to challenge your fear or the fear of failing or not achieving the goal? And has challenging those fears helped push you to where you are today? You have to, because um, I think the two inevitable things in life are that we are gonna die at some point. And the other thing is that you're gonna fail at something. And looking at failure, not as something to avoid, but something to be prepared for when you meet that failure. Um, a lot of people, you know, have this mentality of um, trying to outrun their fears or trying to avoid them or go in a different direction. And when actuality, I think it's more so important to prepare yourself for when failure comes. Failure is going to come. And it could be small, it could be large. Failure, you, there is going to be something that you're going to fail at. And I think the key for me, the transition for me happened when I failed my first board exam. I wasn't ready for that because I had never really failed at anything. Um, I felt like I had been challenged and I had overcome, challenge and overcome. And when I failed, it was a wake up call for me to say like, okay, it was a wake up call for me to get my studies together and get prepared to take the test again. Um, but someone kind of told me like, things like this happen. There are things in life that you will fail at. And sometimes you can't avoid those things. But what you can do is make sure you're prepared, as prepared as you can be. Um, and I think that's key. Always 
always being prepared. Um, preparing yourself with whatever resources you have, calling on other resources or people you may know, getting the support you need is to consistently be prepared because most of the time you fail at something, you know, it's, it's not, it might seem like a negative at the time, but for whatever reason, there's something greater coming next. And I think, I can't remember who said, said it, but it was like, you only fail when you don't learn from your lesson. There's either you failed or you learned a lesson, right? And so it's not a failure if you learned a lesson. And if you stay prepared and you learn from that failure and stay prepared and keep preparing and consistently prepare, um, you should be okay. But just, just staying prepared because failure is inevitable. Um, we're not going to be the best at everything. Um, and being okay with that. Sometimes we want things for ourselves that might not be meant for us. Um, and being okay with knowing that there's something else for us beyond what we think is a failure. There's something else beyond for us. And I think that's another thing that keeps me going is like when one door closes or if I get a setback, and my mom kind of put this in my mind, she would always say, and I hate when people say it, and I hate when I say it. Everything happens for a reason. It's the cheesiest thing you can say. It's so cheesy, but it's so true. It's so true. Anytime you have a, a setback or a failure, there's a reason before behind it. It's the true failure comes when you don't realize that reason or you don't take the next step to move beyond. And you get stuck there. So you can't stay stuck. Got to keep pushing forward. Thank That's you. a good. We we like to say, it's not fair. It's just practice. Right, right. Hmm. Failure is nothing but experience as something that you're gonna accomplish. <laughs> <laughs> so, does anybody have any other questions? Uh, anybody in the crowd? Uh, we're approaching the seven the seven hour mark, seven p.m. Does anybody have any questions before we close out? With seeing nothing, I will say thank you all for coming. This is another great session. Thank you all, and um, look out for the video that will be posted to our website. We hope to see you at our next game plan session. Thank you again, Dr. Good, for everything. Um, if can the students that are watching, can they reach out to you anyway for any advice or any help? For sure. Um, my Instagram is sportsdocshannon, and then my email is sportsdocshannon at gmail.com, S-P-O-R-T-S-D-O-C-S-H-A-N-N-O-N uh, on IG and sportsdocshannon at gmail. Feel free to email me, ask me questions. I mentor students all across the country. <laughs> we have to coordinate time zones sometimes um, because I'm always here to 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 mentor and also um i'm always here because especially for those of you going the medical route you know it's 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 very good to have someone in your corner that's been through that route to really give you the support you need in certain moments i had a mentee reach out to me he said you know i failed step one and i talked to all my mentors and they kept giving me advice and it just didn't click and i said "Ooh, let me call dr good and we sat down and we talked because I had been through what, what he was experiencing at the time. And so I offer that invitation. If there's any type of hardship or trouble navigating something you may have and you just need to talk to somebody, um, I'm here for those life coaching um, mentorship as well. It doesn't always have to be career driven because we all know life happens. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. With that being said, we're closing out the night. We'll catch you at the next game set game plan session. Everyone get home safe. <laughs> Thank you.